4K television. <laughs> I know, <laughs> makes you feel bad. Um, okay, we've got participants come in. Uh, welcome uh, to Dharma Sydney's um, October uh, online webinar. So just let's just give it a few more minutes. Um, so we've got people coming in. So welcome. Um, this is probably our first lunchtime session that we've had in a while, maybe almost a year. So thank you for joining us. Um, thank you. Hi, Namian. Hello, Rona. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Good. Um, so this is the lunchtime session that we've had, first lunchtime session we've had in a while. So I was wondering maybe during the um, presentation that we can maybe do a poll to see, um, maybe give them three options, like 12, 5 p.m. and 6 p.m., because currently we hold our webinars in, at the usual 6 p.m. And just to say which one, what, what time of the day they would prefer, um, and also with the possible changing work arrangements that people might start going back to the offices, um, I don't know whether lifetime will be better or worse. So do you think that would be a good idea? Uh, Rana, have you realized that we have 26 participants already Sorry? joined? Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I believe they, they are listening to us as well. Yeah, 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 okay. yeah, yeah. Um, so I have greeted them. So I'll greet them. I'll greet, uh, I'm greeting you again. Uh, so we've got more and more. Um, we've got 28 now. Um, so, Naimin, do you think that would be a good idea? Maybe we could do that, um, taking the um, taking this opportunity in um, today's yep. webinar to do that. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Um, so, thank you. Um, we're holding this um, event at 12, so I don't know whether that covers more time zones um, around the world because um, I know that we do have international participants as well. So maybe I'll start with saying hi in the chat and, and maybe um, putting your name and where you're from. So the Adelaide, Sydney, Sydney, most of Sydney people. Newcastle, or go Queensland, or Surface Paradise, nice. Canberra. So while we're doing that, um, um, again, I'm reminding you that if you have any questions, please um, use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen um, to ask any questions. You can do that anytime during the webinar and we will try to answer you. Or if the question is related to the, uh, the content being presented or to um, the presenter, we will read them out at the Q&A session. So there's going to be two Q&A sessions. One, um, about 20 minutes into the presentation and the other one at the end of the presentation. So I will share my screen at the moment, uh, right now. So let's get started. Um, So welcome again. Uh, can you see my screen? Okay. Yep. Okay. Cool. Um, so to, so Friday today. Yay. <laughs> um, so uh, welcome to again to our Dharma Sydney webinar. And um, let's get started. Uh, so Dharma Australia and Sydney branch acknowledge the traditional owners of the country throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters, and culture. We pay our respects to their elderly past, present, and emerging. 
so today, um, King's, um, uh, 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 we have a um, speaker from uh, Malaysia, uh, Miles. So thank you um, for joining us, Miles. Um, Miles is based in California uh, State, so it's evening time in his world. So, um, so thank, thanks again. Miles is the leading uh, influencer of CROs in, in the digital world. Um, he is the facilitator for ICO Chat as well as um, an eWeek uh, contributor. Um, he has had particles published in many, many uh, places, obviously. Um, so prior to elation, he was responsible for product man uh, marketing of Informatica's intelligent data platform. And also at uh, HP and um, Paragran, he led a product team applying analytics and big data to companies' IT management products. Miles also holds two master degrees, uh, one of uh, science degree and the other one in business administration and in strategic planning. So welcome and thank you for offering your time, Miles. So I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. I'm really thrilled to be with all of you. And let me bring this up. And I need to go to the front of the presentation and do a, and then I go to a presentation mode. And we're now set. So what I want to do today is to talk a little bit about data and data governance, uh, why it matters, why it's been difficult, and what you all can do to govern data uh, better. Um, there's a lot of reasons to be uh, concerned about data. Obviously, is exploding. So it's not just uh, data that's in a raw form that you have to be concerned about. It's data that's um, ready to go, but how do people find it? Um, and how do people protect it? Because breaches are only increasing. Um, and so how do, I, how do I get better at all the aspects of data? Um, and how do I make it part of what the analysts are calling a, a data ops process? So I'll, I'll share a little bit on all those concepts as we get further in, but obviously we're in an environment where uh, data has become even more important than it was. It was interesting, I, I ran a CIO chat on data literacy today and CIOs were giving me lots of reasons why data is important to their organizations. Uh, obviously it's critical to transformation, but it's also critical to getting the right answers when um, you have to solve an issue as a key stakeholder of a business. So. Um, there's a lot of reasons to do it, and uh, I'll, I'll actually publish their thoughts on that uh, soon. When we look at data governance, I think there's a lot of different reasons to really uh, dig in and, and want to do it. Um, first of all, it's part, in my mind, of delivering an agile modern data architecture. So governance is part of that whole process there. Um, additionally, and, I, and I've interviewed business stakeholders as well on this. I mean, the typical term they use is trustworthy. Uh, is the data trustworthy? I've heard CIOs, I've heard heads of marketing talk about that. So quality and trust really do matter. And data governance is part of that process of, of fixing it. Um, we also have a, a problem that we're probably not going to be able to stop every hack. So how do I protect um, both from internal and external uh, threats uh, data? How do, I, how do I govern it? How do I make sure it's, it's sensitive? How do I do, as my friend Ann Kavokian likes to say, uh, you know, do it privacy by design? Um, that becomes an increasing element of how we deal with data today. Um, the next thing is that if, if I'm good at data governance, I'm going to have those rare people who know how to do data modeling, uh, regardless of, of form and type, they're going to be able to uh, build analytical models faster um, and spend less time massaging data. Um, the former um, chief uh, data officer um, at um, Booz and Company used to say that his data scientists were um, literally better labeled as data plumbers. And so we need to do something about that in order to make that work. And then obviously 
um, we should make this an agile process that supports the whole control and nature of data. That's a critical thing to do. And, and as I've said, the analysts have picked on a term called data ops to encapsulate more than just the, what we're talking about here, but governance is a critical element of doing that. Now, as we've looked at the marketplace, um, there's been a high failure rate. I, I remember when I first started running the CIO chat, I ran something on data governance. And, you know, even though we were doing it on Twitter, I could feel the CIOs doing one of these things to me, implying that they didn't really want to do data governance. And what was happening in a lot of cases, it'd be forced from top down and then what ended up happening was IT would take it over or um, they, they would have to get people to do it, but they didn't really want to do it. And so it, be, because it, you know, oftentimes in the early days, you'd hand somebody a script and say, go find the sensitive data. So in, in today's world, we, we don't want to end up in that world. We want to deal, deal with this failure rate. Um, the other thing in, 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 in talking with the analyst community about this has been a kind of an interesting thing. Um, we found that, um, and by the way, they are um, taking your questions in the Q&A. So if you have questions as they go along, please do uh, add them to the Q&A. And then as we get to kind of halftime for this, we'll, we'll answer some of those questions. The other thing is, is that in many cases, we were focused um, entirely initially on disabling people from doing their jobs. Uh, there was a CDO I, I heard talk recently who talked about, well, the first thing we got to do is control this data and then we'll get to data monetization. Well, if people don't feel like you're enabling them uh, with data, that becomes uh, a problem. And then obviously I've already talked about this top down, often IT managed problem. And then the implementation work was really difficult. Uh, to do, especially if you're doing scripts and have you holistically done this. And, and, and many people have tried to just put rules in where they think they're sensitive data. But as I discovered when I was at H HP uh, running the data and analytics group, it, it was really painful um, to, to go and find out which fields people were actually using and, and which fields they weren't typically using and those kinds of things. So um, if we can get those implementation challenges out, uh, it becomes um, important. One of my colleagues suggested this week that um, really the way we should think about doing things is with a data catalog um, um, focused initial kind of way of doing data governance. And so I'll, I'll talk about automation and what you can do there to make, make this all easier. Um, Gartner's done some studies and they've looked at how well governance has succeeded. And you, know, you can see some numbers there like 20%. Uh, so yet there's an explosion of data. And so obviously, you know, people spent money and, and haven't got to it. Um, at the same time, I like this remark about self-service. What we're discovering is if you can enable that first, uh, that may actually be to your advantage uh, in terms of how, how you do things. So I want to suggest four principles for data governance. And I think these kind of capture, you know, how anybody should want to do this um, if they're trying to set up data governance um, effectively. So I want to suggest that the first thing you want to do um, is to be uh, people first. So you want to, as I said, deliver some value to the, to the, to the workforce in terms of making their job easier. Um, in terms of users of data or data scientists who are making use of data. So if you can make it less onerous of process and not so forced in all of those things, that, that helps. And then with that, there's three more principles that I think are, are should be fundamental to any, how anybody uh, thinks about approaching this. The first one is it should get easier over time. And then there's another concept in here, which is really big. And that is that data isn't a one and done. Data is going to degrade at a regular rate. Forrester's done some analysis on this. Um, but in addition, um, you, you really have to have a continual process with data in order for it to be something that is quote unquote trustworthy. The next principle I want to suggest is that 
you really want the, the process of data governance to be as autonomous as, as possible uh, in terms of how you, you run things. Um, if you want to use um, AI and machine learning and things like that to make the work of being a steward um, using the brain power, but not the brawn. And then lastly, uh, you want this to be end to end. You, you need to set up a process, that process needs to be measured, and then you may need to make course corrections depending upon how you're doing. Those, in my mind, are the key principles that you wanna run a data governance solution uh, by. And so what I've done is I've put them into this model. Now, obviously you may wanna uh, tweak how you do this model yourself, but, but basically I wanna suggest that this is a way that we can think about how data governance gets done. So the first part of it is um, you wanna set up what the goals and standards are. There, there's no getting away from you know, having management agree and having specific goals and objectives in terms of it, whether it's to improve data quality or data security or privacy or whatever those issues are, it's really important to, to capture those uh, and, and define those things and then capture those in a place where it's transparent. Um, I was talking to a couple companies recently and it was interesting because the, the auditors came in every quarter and wanted to see what they were doing. Um, they were in um, industries of compliance, what they were doing to protect data. So having a way to capture those things is important. But the next thing that's important is that you want to start to capture the data and then discover some interesting things from the data. That's important. Um, and then you follow that by empowering uh, the people who are going to be data stewards as much as possible. So it's critical that you, you do that. Um, they're obviously going to then get into curating assets. This is where automation really helps uh, in discovering data, discovering which data you want to do something with, uh, in what order, that kind of things um, is important. And then for sensitive data, um, you want to be able to start to apply policies and controls. And, you know, policies and controls, uh, if we take something like GDPR, which has seemed to have affected everywhere in, that we know of, um, and it even has interestingly affected universities in the United States because so much of their population is foreign. Um, it, you want to be able to now say, you know, you're in um, Australia, um, and you can't see, let's say, um, the records of customers in New Zealand if it was a company that was across both of those things. So those are the kinds of things you want to do. You want to be able to mask that data and hide anything that is considered private uh, in that information. With that, um, it's really important to establish community. Community has an important role in that it will help establish uh, between um, folks, uh, the ability to actually go and um, get recommendations on which data to use or, you know, why should they not be trying to get access to private information or sensitive information they shouldn't have. And the final step in this process is really to monitor uh, and, and measure um, how it's going. So, Together, you get a whole framework, and the idea is this framework gets better and better over time, and that's why I've put the, the continuous improvement uh, in here. So let me walk you through some of these steps and talk a little bit more about the things I think you should be looking for when you're trying to put together a, a data governance type of a solution. So the, the first thing, as I said, is you want to have something that <clears throat> can capture your mission and vision, um, it allows you to create, I, you know, there's a lot of ways you can term, you know, you call this from a terminology perspective. It allows you to create, you know, policies, business policies, you know, hey, here are the standards we're going to follow. Um, here's why. Um, and here's what we're doing about that. So again, this might be where you say, I'm going to comply with GDPR. Uh, if there's any local privacy standards, um, if there's any security standards like NIST or others you're going to follow, 
Uh, this is where you'll capture all of that kind of business information. The, the next step is you want to have the ability to um, populate a catalog. You, what you should want out of this process is not only the ability to ingest metadata, but also hopefully to discover top users. Um, those top users are going to be the folks that you actually want to have as, as data stewards. Um, with that, you want to be able to do some empowerment of these stewards. You want to recognize and assign them. Uh, you want them to be able to um, kind of run the process, but you also want them to be able to act as reviewers and, and to be able to create approvals for things. If you're, in an, if you're a bank or other um, organization in an industry of compliance, you want here the ability for any changes to be um, recognized and reviewed uh, when auditors come in. So, uh, and it's not to say that every one of your, your organizations are going to be like that, but you want to have the ability to have workflow, which is transparent and within a single app framework where you can get reports and other things out of uh, the process. Uh, following that, then you want to have the ability to actually curate data. You want to have the ability to surface descriptions, but also data quality um, and point users to uh, hopefully data that, that is good and worthy of being uh, used. Uh, once you've done all of those things, the next step in, we think in the process is to actually go and apply policies and controls. Uh, this is where you actually do the the actual policy that will typically be in a SQL statement or something like that, where you've, you've written a control appropriately. I've talked about, you know, what community does, how it promotes trusted use. I've talked about being able to leverage that. Um, and then finally, you want to be able to monitor. This is going to look at what your progress at curation is. It's going to look at how well people are using the right data. It's gonna look at whether people are trying to access sensitive data they shouldn't. Um, and, and then lastly, data quality issues. Um, then with that, you can actually go and um, reconfigure what your framework is on. How, how is your mission or vision changed? How does that impact things? Um, those are critical things. So I wanna suggest here again, this process of continuous improvement and, and the goal of how you do this should be to actually drive, um, you know, a end-to-end -end improvement every time you go through the cycle uh, of this. So let me dig down a little bit here uh, in terms of how we kind of think this should happen. So again, the framework, you know, should should be about, you know, what are the policies? Um, how do I create documentation for those policies? and then have the ability to relate those to each other um, so that you have this transparent drill down is, is absolutely, we think, essential to how well this works. So you want to establish those policies so that when you've gotten your stewards, you're kind of ready to go uh, in terms of they know what the general game plan is. Now they have to go discover the data and find out uh, where policy needs to be applied. Following that, you want to do what I described earlier. You want to populate your, your data catalog. Um, hopefully, this is an automated thing. It's not something that's done manually. Um, we've heard horror stories of people ending up with a blanket data catalog and then being told they have to figure out how to do it. So hopefully, what, what happens in this kind of an approach is that you, you have automated connectors that you put in and it actually draws the data in. Um, you want to be able to see through the metadata and the technical metadata in particular um, what's really being used, what's using frequently, uh, and then you want to start to calculate things. So this is where you know AI and machine learning are, are really helpful in the process. Um, you want that uh, to basically discover who are the most popular users of a particular data. The, the nice thing about that is these are the people who care. So if they care, then you're able to do uh, great things here. So that's, that's a really important thing uh, to be able to do here. 
Uh, in empowering stewards, you want to have some forms of dashboard that help them kind of refine their game plan. Um, the big things is they need to be able to find the gaps um, and they need to be able to find, you know, um, where, what's most popular, what, what needs the most attention, and then prioritize all of that as they, uh, they go forward. Following that, you're actually into curating assets. Uh, a really interesting thing here is, is to keep a, a workbench for the four people um, that allows them to see their progress, uh, how, where are they at, what do they need to do next, all of that stuff, develop their game plan for it. Again, one important concept here is that if you can have the curation process almost autonomous in terms of how it runs, um, and you discover um, the key people who, who should be doing this, hopefully what, it, what it's doing is it's not making another job for them. You don't want this to be something where, you know, now I have two jobs and I'm working 80 hours a week versus working, you know, a little extra time a week to make, make this happen. Uh, apply policies and controls. This is actually where you start to um, be able to Put those policies in that are actually going to control things. Um, you see an image over there of an example where there's an SQL rule that's written um, that is about enforcing data and then making it apply. So this is where you want to be able to, to do that. And hopefully uh, this can all be done uh, when, you, when you do this within one application rather than going external for it. And, and one more thing just to mention here. What you'd really like to have happen here is the ability to um, pull policies that have almost have already been created. You know, most people are not on a blank slate. So having an ability to pull policies that have been created in other systems is critical um, to making the work here to be um, less constraining, less, less difficult, because people have generally put some form of controls on their data. Uh, I've talked, you know, pretty much at length. Community is a great idea. People can get involved and share ideas about how things work and all of that. Uh, it makes tremendous sense to have uh, community as part of this uh, process. And the final element is you want to start to show, I mean, you're, you're obviously this is a project as it gets started but it's going to be an activity that will be continuous. But we've got to show to leadership that's putting the investment in that we're making progress, that we're curating a large percentage of assets, that there isn't large points of exposure with sensitive data. Um, and so having the ability to have some form of a governance dashboard is critical uh, to succeeding here. And so monitor and measure is the next step. And then it's going to come take you back um, through to the other end. Now, with automation, once you've gone through this the first time, we're going to have insight into who are the key people that should be governing a particular type of data. And that automation can auto-assign uh, people to, to that if it's done right. So big opportunity there uh, to, uh, to do things. So I'm going to pause here for just a moment. I know we have one question, but if you have questions, please, um, I'd love to hear from you in terms of what you've got. So, so we have a question from um, Louise um, about um, cat data catalog. So the question is, um, is a uh, precursor to populating the data catalog ident identifying all the data assets? Um, She's working in healthcare and one of the key challenges is working out how much data is moving in the organizations um, due to multiple silos operating. Yeah, I, I, I believe data catalog is, and, and please, if I, if I cause another question to happen, please feel free to ask it, but I believe data catalog is a great first step uh, in data governance. Uh, the, the reason it's, it's a good step is that you, you end up generating value uh, for the organization out of the process and um, it, right away. 
And so I, it was interesting. I was looking in, in our case at a couple of customer stories recently, and all of them were talking about two things um, really around self-service. So the, um, the data scientists weren't spending as much time trying to find data, but also the end users. The end users were you know, demanding report after report, which made sense. They needed that data. But if you can make it possible to self-serve um, and the data catalog can, can do that for you, um, it becomes a huge productivity enhancement. I can get my data immediately uh, and, and I don't have to even have uh, programming skills or SQL skills in order to do that. So data catalogs is a great first step. And then you can wrap around it um, the ability uh, to do all those governance steps that uh, uh, I talked about a moment ago. Are there any further questions? Yeah, we've got um, uh, two others. Um, so I've got a question from Michael. Um, any tips on how to trace or capture data flow from different systems and business processes? Yeah, I mean, there, there's kind of two parts to this. One is the, the initial data flow that you're, you're bringing uh, data from a transactional system out, um, you know, in terms of uh, an ETL type process. So, you know, that, that technology is well found. The other thing we're seeing a lot of is that people who are, are doing two things, which is interesting. Um, one is that they're, they're, they're thinking about moving their data from an, a legacy system. Um, that's costing them a lot of money and they want to bring it over uh, into a cloud-based solution or they want to bring certain data over to a cloud-based solution in order to do a customer 360 or something like that. And so uh, we, uh, for those systems and others, we provide um, an collation of connectors out of the box that enable you to actually go and and, and get that data from one place to the other. One other thing that we found, which is kind of clever, is oftentimes people um, in the old days would bring into a data mart or data warehouse um, large amounts of data that potentially weren't relevant. So being able to assess the usage, uh, which is something we do regularly, of data allows you to be able to um, make an intelligent and informed decision about which data you want to bring over and which data you don't. Next question. Yep, uh, we've got <clears throat> Elizabeth. Uh, how many uh, data governance frameworks are there? Is one of the most commonly used? Uh, can you recommend a few to go and read more about it? Thanks. Yeah, there, there are a variety of frameworks. One of the ones I really like that um, a friend of mine, Gwen Thomas, started is from the Data Governance Institute. Um, she, um, she, I, I, a couple of weeks ago, I think they put the site back up. It was a really nice framework to thinking about data governance. Uh, another person that we like a lot is Bob Siner, who's done a lot of thinking about and even written a book on this on non-invasive uh, data governance. So um, I think those would be really good places uh, to uh, start your journey. Uh, and if for some reason you can't get uh, the uh, stuff from the Data Governance Institute, I actually have a couple copies on my machine so I could send it to you electronically. That's fine if you can send it to us and we will get it organized. Elizabeth, I, if let you me could. do that. I will, I will, I'll send it to you directly and you can share it with folks. I, it's a good framework and then obviously Don has been doing stuff for a while in this area yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, Elizabeth is asking if you can type the author, author's names. Um, so if you could do that in the chat, please. Okay, I can do that very quickly. And, and she's worth following on, you know, social media. She's um, right now um, the head of data governance for the World Bank. Um, so she's right. doing really interesting problems. Great. So we can, um, okay, shall we continue? There's no more questions for now. Perfect. That sounds great. So I was asked to provide a couple of data governance case studies. Um, these are some of the organization that Relation has uh, worked with. 
on, on data governance. And so I've just got a couple that I can share here um, that um, are, are interesting and compelling. Uh, what I will say is a lot of these folks did what I described earlier. They started, built their data catalog, got that going, got value for the business, and then wrapped the, the rest of the framework around it. Um, so um, this is an American, uh, their top 20 American insurance company. Now, I'll be honest with you. For some reason, in the United States, we have 5,000 banks and 5,000 uh, healthcare organizations and about several hundred insurance companies where in many countries, there's only a couple of those. So, but this, this is a very successful company. Um, they've been written about in, I'll put the name in the chat. You can get my review on this, by the way, uh, if you look for it, but Randy Bean has just done a book on managing data and I've done a review of it um, for um, eWeek. And, uh, but he, he goes into a lot of um, depth on what American Family was trying to do. It was really quite an amazing story to hear about because they were literally trying to transform their entire business model to be data-driven and to make everybody in the entire insurance company be able to get at and use data um, and to stop having a myriad of reports coming out uh, of the process. And as well, um, being an insurance company, they're in an industry of compliance, so they had to actually find and then govern uh, sensitive data. And let me make this go forward. Oops. And uh, this is just a quote that came out about how they were able to put the business rules and find the right data, which is you know, a key portion of it. Now, I mentioned Wynn Thomas a moment ago. One of the things in the, um, that they've done is they've defined like six or seven different types of data governance. So um, I think it will be useful and interesting to you to be able to, uh, to see. Another, Customer of ours who's been very innovative in what they're doing uh, is Cisco, uh, the networking company. Um, they have uh, basically uh, put together a, um, a data catalog and then they've created policies and, um, and it basically they've gotten real control over how they're doing it. They're using a lot of what we have from machine learning to the ability to generate articles, which is what we call it, is higher level um, men mentions of standards and things like that, that you want to be following in addition to policies that you have. So Cisco has been doing data governance for quite a while with us and sees it as a, a really important thing uh, that they're able to do in terms of visibility uh, for their user community, but also visibility for their their customers and doing it in an appropriate uh, manner and way. And then lastly, um, Fifth Third Bank is a top uh, 10, top 15 bank in the United States. It's kind of a unique name, um, but they had to do all forms of compliance, including BCBS 239, which is a big compliance standard um, over here. Um, and they basically needed to be able to find um, the critical information and then govern that data. Um, and a lot of the workload that they experienced, as well as the other customers I've mentioned, uh, was in the discovery phase. So, and I've had this, as I, I think I applied earlier, I've had this discussion several times with CIOs when they look at data security, they say the first thing that you need to do uh, is to be able to know what data I have and the same for privacy. So, um, I would, uh, you know, what they did was to try and find all the sensitive data and then also try and govern that data so that they had a quality level that, that made sense. And this was just a nice little quote about how they met their, their requirements on BCBS uh, 239 um, with elation. Um, what I'd like to do now is share with you, um, we announced this on the 14th and of uh, September. And I'd like to share with you our new data governance app and some of its key features. I've kind of implied some of this earlier, but I thought it'd be better in the initial conversation to kind of talk about, 
you know, what requirements drove us that we got from our customers. And so now what I'd like to do is just feature the data governance app. Now, to be clear, the data governance app uh, sits on top of our data catalog. So you can't, you can't just buy the data catalog. Now you could, you could say, hey, I'm going to start with data catalog. I'm going to prove out the value of data. And then after, a, after you do that, you could, you could obviously put the data governance app um, into what you're doing. But um, on the other hand, if you need to get immediately on data governance, you want the app up, you want to be doing catalog at the same time. So it really depends on where you are and what you want to do. So let me just share some of its capabilities uh, with you. So uh, the first thing we, we knew we needed to create was a separate object called policy and then the ability to have multiple policies that could be related to each other and then nest those two together. So you have the transparency. So I kind of implied that earlier, but that was a critical requirement uh, for our product uh, management team and the development team was to make it possible to uh, create these data policies and then um, to be able to relate them and then have uh, controls come in. Um, so that was a, that was a critical uh, element of what we did. The other thing we did that we thought was critical was we created a bi-directional link uh, with Snowflake. And the reason we did that, we're going to do that for other um, uh, data warehouses, uh, is we wanted the ability uh, to capture any policies they may have created, but also going forward, if we discover sensitive data that's exposed, uh, to then be able to have a creation of the uh, policy, uh, I'm sorry, we wanted to then be able to create controls within us that would then be fed back in. So we made a bi-directional link uh, with them. Uh, we created a homepage for stewards because we felt they're doing a regular set of things that are different from others, so they have their own homepage. The other thing is we felt um, for a long time, you know, we had recommended other tools and things like that, but we really felt that there needed to be a, a change management workflow. It needed to be something that was written in English rather than in SQL um, because the approvers wouldn't necessarily be coders. So we created a change management workflow as part of this. Um, the next thing we added was a stewardship workbench. This was the ability to streamline and simplify activities, set up priorities, figure out all of the things that need to go on. And then finally, the ability to create those dashboards that we talked about. So I'll just go really quickly through some of this and then answer any questions you have on the back end. So this is the, uh, the data, let me just make sure it took me right. Nope. Yeah, here's Policy Center. This is just giving you an example of how policies are, are put together. One other thing that we did is, um, for those of you who are in financial institutions, we actually just um, followed um, something called the Median Council, and we've actually built out higher level descriptions of what you're trying to do is what we call an article, and then we hyperlink down to the controls and to the policies so that you have this one very nice, connected, tightly linked thing. And you can see here, a control for credit card number in terms of what is masked and what is not masked uh, for particular users um, that haven't been authorized. Uh, this is the home page. Um, basically, it has the uh, ability uh, to capture workflows, as I said, and you can go right from here to wherever you need to go to start out your day. It's not going to let me go, so I'm going to have to rank myself in order to. Oh, now it's not letting me do it. Okay, hopefully it goes away. Uh, the next thing is this notion of workflows. Again, these should be written in English statement um, in terms of these controls that you want to implement, or changes in standards, or changes in policy. Um, they should be things that people can understand who are going to be approvers, and then obviously. Once those get approved, that becomes part of your transparency documentation of how you're running uh, things. And then the dashboard 
this is really where the kind of rubber meets the road. As we talked earlier, this is how you actually go and see how you're doing, um, how, how are you conforming to policy. Um, one of the things I've suggested from my previous experience for a, a growth thing here is to show improvement period over period. That's really what you want to see. You want to see that you're getting better and better at doing what you're doing, which fits with kind of a continuous uh, improvement way of thinking. And so I want to leave you with just a couple of parting thoughts, and then I'd love to answer any questions. So please use the Q&A function if you have a question. I want to suggest, as you can see in this uh, image, that effective data governance is really built on four principles. People first, continuous improvement, autonomous, and end-to-end. -end. That with this, you can create um, the core data management uh, practices you need or what the analysts are now calling uh, data ops. Uh, you know, data governance uh, based on those four principles makes everything easier. And it, uh, it, Data governance, as I've, I've suggested, is not just about compliance. It's about generating the quality data that you need uh, to transform. Um, my friend, uh, Jeannie Ross, who uh, until just recently was at MIT Scissor, uh, in her book, she talks a lot about how data is foundational, along with a series of other technologies, uh, to being able to transform um, and she gives lots of interesting case examples where people have been able to take their uh, legacy companies and been able to out Amazon, Amazon, for example, where they've been able to um, actually go and use their historical data and, and their supply chain data to actually figure out um, what customers want that they have and then deliver that regardless of channel. All of that gets powered by data. And so that's why your roles are so important in the data community and why this kind of continuous improvement framework matters. So with that, I'm done with the slides. Uh, do we have any questions that you'd like to uh, ask about? So we do have um, three questions. Uh, one from Kathy. Does a uh, Latian platform include capacity for Business glossary, metadata management, and data modeling. Uh, it does include, and I'm going to have I have a colleague on, but it does include the glossary functions, the ability to do that. It it is <clears throat> focused on significantly on metadata management. Um, the third item, um, I'm going to ask my colleague to speak up for just a moment. Okay, so the next question is from Yvonne. Um, on business rules, do you have a recommended approach of how the business rules should be sourced from the business and structured? Uh, we've spent a lot of time going in a lot of time going in circles where proposed business rules are actually data quality rules instead. Yeah, it, it, it's it's. I, I don't want to say that that part of it is easy. Um, it clearly involves. Um, connecting with your business uh, stakeholders. I think it's, it's why it's so important to find out who's regularly using which pieces of data. Uh, they're going to know uh, what kind of rules you should apply uh, to quality. Um, one of the things we've done to help here a little bit is we've built uh, integrations to data quality tools so that you can run that as part of your, your governance process. But if there's no getting around that we really need the business involved uh, in data. And, and, and oftentimes, I'm gonna, you're going to hate me on saying this, but oftentimes it comes to the CEO. The CEO is the one who's going to make a data-driven company um, if they've got that, that perspective and value. Next question. That was certainly a very common, I think, very common situation that many of us face. Um, in terms of just in the previous question, in terms of the capabilities of the Latian platform, so if you do want to find out more about um, the, the, the platform and the product, please contact um, Latian. You can contact Miles directly or um, Rajiv, who is the representative of, of, um, of the Latian Australian Australia uh, branch, if you like. So please do that if you'd like to find out more. 
Um, next question is from Jess. Is there a way on the dashboard to track a metric such as percentage of data accessed from recognized system of record? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I think you can do that. I mean, I it's not in there right now, but it's, we, it, there's a lot of growth that we're planning to do with the dashboard um, so that you can see that. I mean, one thing we can see, um, uh, we measure already is, is popularity of a particular data asset or field or whatever. We have the ability to help use that to figure out what gets governed. But um, yes, um, that's, that's a critical metric and there, there are gonna be more that we add over time. So the next question is from uh, Mark. Uh, lineage is one of the biggest challenges where um, did an element in report come from or um, how it was transformed along the way, um, uh, e.g. from CRM to EDM to BI, et cetera. So any clever ways of reverse engineering this by um, interrogating the different layers or by reverse engineering the ETL scripts, or is it up just up to, uh, or is it just capturing um, the as it knowledge in the developer's head? Yeah, we've, we've built an element of lineage in what we do. And we've also partnered with people like Manta who are really good at, at lineage and, and source of data. And we've actually created reports and things like that where you can directly see where data comes from. I know that in financial services institutions in particular, um, especially with things like fraud, you need to be able to say where the data came from. So uh, we found that in what we do in the catalog itself, it's really critical uh, to be able to do data lineage. And so um, Rajiv uh, can obviously um, show you what we do from a lineage point of view to help but we, lineage has always been a critical element to any of this well. I think that's all the questions. So if you have, oh, sorry, there's um, one more. Okay. Um, does Alation uh, integrate with uh, enterprise architecture tools to allow for end-to-end -end impact analysis? Uh, not presently. I, 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 I'm, I'm actually almost TOGAS certified. I couldn't get the test. <laughs> so I, I, I'm a big fan of what they, what enterprise architecture is doing. No, we don't currently integrate, but um, it, it's interesting to think about what would happen if you could, you could look at that um, over time. It's just not something we've done right now. Sure. Um, so if you have more questions, we do have time for one or two more. So please type in. Um, so while we are waiting for any more questions, I'll just um, briefly talk about the uh, results, the poll results. Um, I asked if um, for the participants to uh, give a rating on the data government's maturity in your organization, in your opinion, one being least mature, five being most most mature. So not surprisingly that um, most people rated uh, one. So it's almost in this reverse order, if you like. So one being least mature was the, we had the most percentage of um of votes and then two followed by two, three, four, and five. So it seems like the um, data government governance is an area that um, people need to work on. Um, so there's another poll going on um, that it re relates to our webinar time. So if you have, um, please, if you haven't, if you haven't had time to look at the um, to, to make your choice, please do so. Uh, we are considering different um, uh, times to maximize our attendance. So thank you very much. Um, any more questions? Okay, I think, um, oh, there's another, uh, there's two more. Okay. Um, so, uh, first one, I can't see the answer to the question on authors, but I'm very interested in sourcing these 
guys to do the same, to do some more reading. Could you circulate, please? Okay. Um, so if you could circulate, um, would you have a mouse? Would you have a link or or, or some somewhere that you can? Was it a physical copy? A link, like, to, a link to what? Um, this is related to the previous question on the Data Institute document. Oh yeah, I, I'm going to send you the documents. I have a physical copy here, so I'll send them to Rajiv uh, right after yeah. we get done. Yeah. Then, so if you would like a copy, please contact us um, on sydney.events.dima.org.au. We I will list that um, email address um, in one of our slides uh, in a minute. So another question. Um, do you see data literacy being a key requirement before embarking on data governance uh, implementation? Oh, that's a tough one. I <laughs> Certainly mean, it helps. <laughs> no, I know. It's, it's tough because um, you, you want an organization that understands fundamentally the value of data and what kinds of questions they can ask and those things. Uh, and so you're hoping that, that you have that. But... Um, you know, you possibly can do both simultaneously if you have sponsorship, yeah. but, um, and, and it, it is interesting. It, it is it's kind clear. of a chicken and egg um, it is. theme. Yeah. It is. it is. Yeah. And the next question is related to us. Will the YouTube be available on, oh, sorry, the video be available on YouTube channel? Um, if you're a, um, member, you can actually go to our member uh, section of the website to download slides. But if you would like a recording, uh, we can upload it to the to the to YouTube, um, which we don't normally do. But there is uh, a capability to do so. So, if David, if you like to request one, please email us. So I will take over. Thank you, Miles. I will take over yeah. the screen. And I will, I did stop the screen share. It's okay, I think I can, I should be able to. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Great. So um, with Sydney's reopening, we are still um, using online webinars to contact to con um, conduct our upcoming monthly meetings, um, at least in the immediate foreseeable future. But um, at the same time, we're working with sponsors and presenters in reviewing the reopening situation for possible um, future in-person meeting. Um, the other thing is um, if you do, so sponsors and partners, if you do have a career opportunities um, to be promoted, uh, we are happy to do so. Uh, while we are still evaluating um, the possible creation of a Dharma job board, uh, we can promote it in LinkedIn. And um, we did actually receive positive, uh, positive uh, responses from one of our uh, sponsors um, saying that they've um, had a few applications through our channel um, for a, 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 a data architect, I believe. Um, opportunity. So please send over um, any job openings if you do have one, or have, we're happy to promote it for you. So, and members, if you have opinions and feedbacks, please um, share your thoughts um, on uh, sydneyevents.dama.org.au. And also, as I previously mentioned, um, if you would like to request um, a copy of the document, please also email us on this email address. Um, sponsorship opportunities, please contact us on any of the emails below. Uh, we are talking, we are happy to discuss uh, many future events, whether it's pers personal or webinar. Um, so please come forward and um, contact us. Um, again, please join us um, while it is open, while the uh, webinar is open for everyone to join. Um, there are mem member benefits. So if you like to download a copy of the slides, um, you need to be a member. So it's available in the membership section. And also there are other benefits as well, such as um, free sponsored event. Um, we did actually have an um, event a few months back um, where uh, we had sponsored um, dinner, uh, a, a seated dinner, 
for our members. And also if you um, would like a copy of the video, it's also available to our members only. So please join us if you haven't done so. And thank you very much for participating. Um, thank you, Elation. Thank you, Miles and Rajiv for, um, for your time today. Thank you so much. We are right, um, right on time. So thank you very much. That will conclude the, um, the webinar today. Thank you. Have a nice day.